record. Uh, perhaps we only have records on the people who couldn't afford to pay a privacy premium and protect their information. Uh, in any case, uh, next, uh, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage uh, an illustrious panel of my regional colleagues. Uh, the state of data protection in the Caribbean is emerging, so much so that this conversation tonight is our first time meeting together in person. Uh, so certainly a cause for celebration, uh, which we'll do more of later this evening. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming our moderators, Stuart Dresner and Laura Lincomies of Privacy Law and Business. Over to you, Stuart and Laura. Please welcome our panel. Panel, please come through. Don't be shy. Thank you, that's great. So, good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen. So, I'm Stuart Dresner, founder and chief executive of Privacy Laws and Business, and Laura Linkovis is my lo long standing colleague, editor of PLNB reports. Thank you to Alex for the privilege of opening this conference with privacy law developments in the Caribbean community. Now, I have attended most of these conferences since 1982, when data privacy was a newborn subject, but now we live in a data-driven society. I started PLMB, Privacy Laws and Business, in 1987. Then we covered about 10 countries. And now, in our blue international report, we cover 162 countries with laws and more jurisdictions with bills. So here they are, and they'll be available tomorrow. We have writers from all over the world, and editions are available on your computer or mobile. And our website is privacylaws.com. Here in, here in Bermuda, we are one of the 24 Caribbean jurisdictions with a data protection law out of 32 countries in the region. Now, there's a lot of diversity. Geographically, most of the countries are islands, but also it includes parts of nearby Latin America with historical and cultural ties to these islands. Languages, it's not only English. Also, other islands speak Spanish, French, or Dutch. And economically, there's a huge range uh, across the region. Political systems, there's communism in Cuba, and most of the other countries are free market economies. The Commonwealth and the Caribbean community could, in the future, have influence on the laws in the region, but the real influences are the United States and the European Union, often pulling in different directions on privacy issues. Now, we said this is a regional cooperation event, most of our panel members are meeting here for the first time, and the benefits of regional cooperation are represented by this session. And they are an exchange of experience and mutual support, development of privacy law norms, interpretations, and implementation for authorities, business, and individuals. And there is clearly scope for not only one session, but also a whole conference on data protection laws in the Caribbean. So here today, we will focus on the laws in Bermuda, Barbados, the Bahamas, and Jamaica, with comments also on the Cayman Islands and Guyana. We want to learn not only what the laws are, but what is happening regarding implementation and enforcement, which in some jurisdictions follows a rather relaxed pace. To introduce the panel, our panel, I'm handing over to Laura, our editor, and you're going to introduce the panel to us. Thank you. Welcome to our fantastic panel tonight. Uh, you are in for a real treat here. So I will introduce our speakers in the order that they will be speaking tonight. First next to me is Dr. Marisa Stones. She's a senior analyst, information and privacy in the cabinet office of the government of Bermuda. She has worked in the technology industry, both in Bermuda and the United States for over 25 years, and worked on privacy issues in her various roles in the government of Bermuda. Then we have Lisa Greaves. She's the Data Protection Commissioner of Barbados and a lawyer with more than 20 years' experience. 
As Data Protection Commissioner, Lisa has the overall responsibility for developing and implementing a regulatory framework for the processing of personal data. Then we have Michael Wright, who is the Data Protection Commissioner of the Bahamas. Michael's vast experience ranges across a myriad of industries with emphasis on finance, financial services, ICT and corporate governance. After Michael, we have Laura Swartz Henderson. She's an advocacy and research advisor at Internews USA. Internews is an international media support nonprofit which has a presence in more than 100 countries. And Laura works particularly on technology policy, human rights, and privacy. Next, we have Bartlett Morgan. He's director at Chanjury Advocates in Barbados. He's a lawyer and a privacy consultant and provides support to clients with respect to their operations in the Caribbean, United States, and South America. He also publishes updates on his Caribbean blog, bartlettmorgan.com. And last, Dr. Patrick Anglin is the DPO at the University of the West Indies, Jamaica. Patrick has been involved in several initiatives at the IT strategic level and has provided leadership in areas such as identity management platform, IP address, rationalization, and university-wide IT policy framework. Now, just a few housekeeping points. We will shortly hear presentations by each speaker, followed by panel discussion, and then questions from the audience, which we very much welcome. Speaker slides will be available tomorrow on the event page of the Privacy Laws and Business website, and also we are posting the laws there that we are discussing tonight. And you will be able to catch this session again, if you wish so, on video um, on the Bermuda Privacy Commissioner's YouTube page. And now on to the panel. Marisa, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It is so wonderful to have the Global Privacy Assembly here in Bermuda. And um, as, as a person who has uh, been on this long journey uh, as it relates to Bermuda's privacy legislation, um, uh, the Personal Information Protection Act, otherwise known as PIPA, I am very, very excited to be on this panel. So first, I've been asked to uh, provide a bit of an overview about PIPA. And um, you will probably hear quite a bit about PIPA over the next couple of days. I see that there are um, many representatives from, from industry and, uh, and uh, from the Privacy Commissioner's Office and such on many panels. So you will be able to get a flavor of what um, happens in Bermuda, why we've developed PIPA the way that we have developed it. And um, first and foremost, yes, PIPA will be fully in force on January 1st, 2025. Uh, only certain clauses are currently in force. And um, this provides a, a runway, I guess you can say, for um, all organizations that will be affected by PIPA. Uh, to, to become prepared. Now, you do have to um, understand that Bermuda has never had a standalone privacy law. Um, many pieces of legislation may have the OECD privacy principles integrated within them, but in general, we have not had a standalone privacy law. Um, you probably have uh, uh, understand or have been hearing about Bermuda from an international business perspective. And um, Bermuda is seen as a um, blue chip jurisdiction. And we wanted to ensure that in the development of data protection and privacy legislation, that international best practice was in place. Bermuda is a small country. Um, I mean, 21 square miles. Uh, 68,000 people, you know, we are very small and, and, you know, punching well above our weight. So even though many of our international businesses are meeting international privacy requirements because they have to in order to do business, uh, we do have concerns about smaller organizations, you know, in essence, you know, the lifeblood of, of our community. Um, you know, they are vulnerable, you know, having gone through the pandemic and such, we, we see the vulnerability that, you know, the, the community within which we live in, um, you know, is, is with 
people not coming to the island, people not shopping, you know, it pro great vulnerability within the community. So we wanted to, to ensure, we, we know that economic impact on your entire jurisdiction uh, has to be weighed. So local business is a key driver for employment within Bermuda, for example. And in the development of privacy legislation, you do not want to unduly burden them. So the development of PIPA invo involved consultation, and a great deal of consultation. And I invite you to have conversations with uh, some of the members of the uh, that you will be interacting with over the, the coming days, uh, Nancy Valeski, uh, Eduardo Usteran, as to how much work went into the development of uh, this bespoke legislation. Um, we decided that we wanted to have a legislation that reflected best practice, but also um, had flexibility for those smaller organizations that were not necessarily doing um, you know, business um, with the types of um, organizations or um, you know, those that were having to do business with um, the US or um, other uh, intermediaries that you know, were not necessarily uh, you know, operating at that same level. Um, that the international businesses needed to operate at. However, we wanted to ensure that you know, the protections were there, um, human rights were protected, and we, we needed to operate between the US, Canada, the UK, um, European Union countries, the Caribbean. How do you develop something that can you know, work within all of these areas? And you know we were, you know, working through this in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009. You know, many of the conversations that you know we hear uh, happening right now. You know, we wanted to develop something that would be able to work within that environment. Um, we brought together a cross-border team in the development of PIPA, and with representation from the U.S., Canada and the U USA in addition to, um, and the UK, in addition to uh, the privacy team in Bermuda. And, you know, we developed a draft based on the Alberta um, privacy legislation, factoring in, um, you know, EU approaches and such, so that, you know, in essence, what we were able to develop was, uh, you know, something that was beneficial um, to smaller organizations but also could meet those needs of the international businesses. Um, additionally, once the draft was completed, um, we had the ability to then have conversations with um, other regulatory bodies. Um, we were able to look at certain matters that we had concerns One. about and work through those. So, you know, it, it is very, beneficial that we were able to work with many different area, uh, areas, many different countries, what were the areas that they wish that they could do more with. We um, are very thankful to BIDPA for the um, access and the feedback that they provided to us. So I was then asked, um, you know, what are we doing in the way of awareness? And I've pulled together um, many Organizations, many bodies, including PrivCom, have been doing training and awareness within the community. And I just wanted to cover a few of the areas that we've been doing. And first and foremost, the most important area is promoting the development of a privacy culture within our, organ uh, within our country. Uh, so you'll see the um, awareness campaigns and the training and everything, but ultimately we're trying to get organizations to make privacy a way in which they do business. Um, sometimes that means they need to engage experts because sometimes you don't listen to the people within your own organizations and you want to be able to you know, get the best to provide you advice as to how to deal with it. Um, we do try to encourage personal privacy management because if you 
are protecting your information, you are then more concerned about what your organizations are doing. And then also looking to, you know, what identifiable information about an in individual, you know, might be present in the work that you're doing within your, um, when it, within your offices, within your charities, within the things that you do. Um, in Bermuda, as you can expect, you know, only a few pieces of information can identify someone very easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it is very important that we get people to start thinking about that. And then ultimately, organizations need to think about the personal information that they are collecting. Yep, no problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> And on to Lisa, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so basically, I've been asked to give an overview of Barbados's law, but it's impossible to give an overview <laughs> in three seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a little bit of context, and then I'm going to talk about a specific area that I think is a mind shift for a country like Barbados. So I think... Generally, the context for having a Data Protection Act, which came in 2019, is Barbados was doing two very ambitious initiatives. We were rolling out a digital ID, because before we had had a paper-based kind of ID, because we are, were a paper-based, we're a paper-based society moving to a digital society. <laughs> and we were doing digital transformation. Digital transformation was a vision of our prime minister. She wanted to digitalize government. She wants, you know, Barbados was going digital. So part and parcel of that and what's integral to that is having a data protection act because you have to protect the constitutional right to privacy. Everybody here knows this. So what I think would be a mind shift for businesses in Barbados is it is a concept and an approach that exists in other regulatory spaces, but now they're looking at it in terms of data protection, which is taking the good old risk-based approach. And companies don't want to hear that. Companies want you to tell them what to do. Give me the prescriptive approach. Do I tick here, 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 and here? Good. I have fulfilled your obligations. And the risk-based approach is saying, nah, son. Nope, does not work like that. You actually yourself have to identify, assess, and mitigate the risk when dealing with people's personal data. So the 2019 Data Protection Act looks at, it highlights three areas, but the concept of a risk-based approach channels right through the act. So you've got data breaches. Data breaches say you will report a breach to the commissioner if the breach is a high risk to your customers, to your clients, that kind of thing, which means you have to do what? Conduct a risk assessment. Nobody wants to hear that, that's what you have to do. In order to, because how would you know if it's high risk if you don't conduct a risk assessment and determine to report it to the regulator? Then we've got data protection impact assessments. That's when you're using a new technology. And right now, every government ministry in Barbados is implementing a new technology. And what does that mean? You have to conduct a risk assessment because you have to show you've identified, you've assessed these risks of this new technology, and more importantly, you have commensurate measures in place to mitigate that risk. So you have to inculcate risk in your decision making. You have to know your risk appetite. You have to know what the threats are, what the vulnerabilities are, what the threshold is. And then we have data transfer assessments. Personal data is zipping all around the Caribbean, it's zipping all around the world. And you have to make an assessment of the countries, the jurisdiction that you're sending the data to. Is their framework commensurate or higher than yours? Now, this is a kind of approaches that are well established in other regulatory regimes, but data protection is a very new concept for the Caribbean and for Barbados especially, because we're a small island, right? We know everything about everybody anyway, so, you know, why? But it's to recognize the importance of it. And then building awareness and sensitization on a budget. Oh, wow. Well, on a minuscule budget, <laughs> building awareness and sensitization, these are some of the stuff I've implemented um, or I've done. I've partnered with other interest groups to build awareness, because it's a new concept, it's very new. We have a lot of personal information that's publicly accessible, 
but it was publicly accessible in an analog format, and now you're moving to a digital format. So there is building awareness that way. Then there is, of course, carrying out um, sensitization sessions similar to this, which I've done a few of those with the public sector and getting them aware because people have, government holds the most information on you from birth to death and everything in between. So it's getting an understanding that now you have to treat personal information like money, right? Because that's basically what it is. Data is money. And then, of course, the one that I love is never waste a good crisis because you promote something when a crisis occurs. So basically, it is should. When I say crisis, I use it loosely, but we have had a few data breaches. And then you have a data breach, and it grounds an institution, or it grounds an agency, and suddenly everybody's like, wait a minute, don't we have a Data Protection Act? And it's like, yeah, you do. You do. And you have some obligations under that act when there's a data breach. So it's sensitizing people to what their obligations are, to how to mitigate, how to protect, how to treat the data like money, because that is a concept we are now coming to grasp. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. And then moving swiftly from Barbados to Bahamas, Michael, please, the floor is yours. Yes. Good evening, everybody. OK, here. Real brief. The Bahamas has been involved with data protection for some time, taking note that the directive from the UK out of 1998 we bought data protection as law in 2003, brought it into force in 2007. I currently serve as the data protection commissioner, but I happen to be the third. And at this time, the longest serving, okay? Much has happened in the Bahamas from when it was introduced to now. I recall sitting in on a general conference such as this, and the then information commissioner who was responsible, uh, Elizabeth Denham, said that we're finding ourselves in extraordinary times. Many looked at the emergence of technology in this digital society as something that may have been passing and was not really here to stay. But over time, we started to embrace it. And in embracing it, we realized that there were so many, I'll, I'll forgive me too if I seem to move through because I can't just miss out anything if I could, right? And it's gonna be made available for you as well. What, what we realized that many at the highest level within government didn't have a real appreciation for what data protection was. We started to listen. We learned that they were talking now about FOIA, Freedom of Information. That, we know for a fact, has personal information involved with the public information. So together with the information commissioner, I've been working closely as they try to bring that into law in its entirety. We believe that the more we share and the more we expose our key civil servants to, the executive branch would start to have much more of an appreciation for where we are at this day and time. We respect the civil liberties of each data subject that's within our jurisdiction. But we also understand that there are many who do not even know their rights as data subjects. Okay? So what I've been able to do is to set up an office. Previously, it was just one particular individual working in the role of data protection commissioner and seemingly was not really receiving the type of regard that many thought he should have or she should have, right? Because that had been both lady and female, lady and male. And their focus was very different from mine. My focus today is really hinged a lot on the evolution of technology and ensuring that it's a good complement within the office based on titles, as you would see. Hopefully, it's clear enough. But if not, just briefly, the legal officer, the finance, uh, finance officer, education and training, the research investigative officer, because there are breaches, we do investigate. We also realize that in order for such an office to be effective, you need to be resourced sufficiently and sustainably. 
We believe that in order for this to happen, it has to go beyond the subvention offered by government. Because when that happens, the general public's perception of independence is really withered away. So we are now proposing new legislation, but not adopting in its entirety the general data protection regulation, which is the gold standard. We have a very unique economic model and we would, we would wish not to have such legislation prove to be too onerous for existing businesses and those are seeking to do business in our jurisdiction. So far, the draft bill that has been made available, it's not out for circulation yet to the general public, but it has received the nod and the affirmative from the Attorney General, from the executive branch in a limited way, we know we have to go do the stakeholders, we've got to do the round table, we have to be able to engage our stakeholders sufficiently so that they don't feel that we're forcing something on them. And in this way, within the new legislation that's been, that's been drafted, within the bill that's been drafted, we have reflected the need for a national registry. Within that national registry for all data controllers and processors, we're going to develop a tier system that deals with the fees. We can't rely anymore only on, any, uh, on case law where there are fines because they come few and far between and many challenges exist. So we have gotten the type of support thus far to advance the thinking and the consideration of introducing new legislation. Many asked us initially, why not give thought to simply amending well, the reason for that was there were so many changes and there's so many distinctions that we didn't want it to just be the authority of the minister responsible or whose remit it falls under. We wanted more accountability for the commissioner in the role that I play to serve under a supervisory board. This is very important for the public's acceptance and the confidence in the role that we have and the charge that we have to deliver and protect our data subjects. Um, here, I've laid out a few changes or what we're proposing. Um, so much things have been going on and we've just been accepting it. The good thing is, there hasn't been so many complaints. We've had those who have complained. We have many entities that have existed where they've had major breaches. Because of the relationship, as my colleague have indicated, we're, as island nations, we're small. Most often, we find ourselves running into the individual who may have been, who, who was the complainant? And do you think they wait until they see you in the office? <laughs> All right, they see you in the supermarket or church and they start to talk to you. And you don't want to send the wrong message as if you're just giving off this free advice and you're supposed to be the regulator. So we, we know how we go about it. We're gonna have to find some ways and means that everyone who buys into what it is that we do they respect the role of the Data Protection Commissioner and its office. So again, like I said, um, there were many pieces of the existing legislation that required not only amending, but as relates to the technology piece, we are right now as a country um, going through this national digitization project. Excuse what, me, Mr. Wright, one more minute. Yes, <laughs> okay, so that national digitization project will enable and would allow much more efficiency within the public sector and be more accountable for those who are behind the keyboard striking those keys. Okay, so I hope that as short as it has been, <laughs> it has proven to be sufficient for you to engage you and provoke thought. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Then moving on to uh, here a researcher's perspective. Laura, please. How do I go back? Hi, everybody. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, the moderators and conveners uh, for inviting me to such an amazing panel with the, all the people who are here. Uh, you might be wondering, who is this lady? Uh, I'm a bit of an outlier. Uh, and I am coming from an organization called Internews uh, that focuses mostly on human rights and freedom of expression. 
And a few years ago, we started to work on uh, data protection and privacy as more and more countries around the world were adopting data protection laws and frameworks um, with the understanding that there needs to be a robust community of human rights defenders um, and lawyers who are able to support the work of the regulators. Uh, so we began doing that work and one of the things that kept coming up over and over again with the groups we were working with was we don't have much understanding of the role of the regulators. We don't understand the constraints they face. We've passed a law, uh, we're at this stage of the process, but we would like to be able to engage more and support their work. So we um, did some research uh, based on a number of events with regulators like those on uh, this panel and um, a few and interviews. Um, and that focused on Latin America and Africa. And I'll just shout out my co-author and Eduardo Bertoni, who unfortunately can't be here, uh, but did a really wonderful foreword um, uh, with, on his experience uh, in Argentina. Um, and then I just wanted to call out, there's a great report from 2020, so a little bit old, uh, from ECLAC at the United Nations on data protection in the Caribbean that echoes some of our findings as well. Um, so a lot of these things won't surprise anyone in the room, but especially the people who are on this panel. Um, things that we heard about the laws that had been passed uh, were that um, very nicely it is becoming easier to convince political elites to pass uh, data protection laws for harmonization purposes, uh, but that often that's done without a lot of local consultation. Uh, and um, to paraphrase one of the people we interviewed, it ended up being much a, a box checking exercise uh, with little thought for how uh, very broad laws that are conforming to international standards will be enforced. Um, and also, uh, many of the people that we interviewed said over and over again, there's not really an understanding of what data protection even is. Because we passed the law without um, having to get public will involved, um, we are, it's harder for us to do the hard work of setting up a regulatory body, demanding the budget that we need. Um, so that leads me to the next piece, which is establishing a authority and structural challenges. Uh, often there's an absence of legislative clarity in the law. Um, so, and this is something Lisa talked about a lot uh, in our conversations. Uh, the, some some uh, regulators, uh, as Dr. Stone says, have a bit of a runway, but uh, unfortunately for others, there is the, um, belief that very small regulatory bodies can uh, balance their startup, uh, so staffing, uh, figuring out their organizational structure, also with their legal mandates, oversight, and enforcement. Um, I do not need to tell anyone on this stage that resources are probably one of the main problems, um, that funding is very low. I think the most recent statistic that I saw was uh, Latin America, the average is uh, $700,000 or uh, annual budget with 12 staff. Um, and then uh, one thing that came up over and over again across jurisdictions were threats to independence. So laws have been passed without really an understanding of um, how the regulator would be structured and often they're structured under a minister, a minister uh, uh, executive, and um, they also don't have often budgetary independence as well. And then all of this leads to challenges with compliance and enforcement, building awareness when you are so low resourced, uh, lack of judicial experience, um, needs, uh, staff needs for technical expertise often to do uh, the enforcement and investigating breaches and insufficient punitive measures. So the reason we put this research together was really to think about best practices, and the reason I'm happy to be talking to all of you at the Global Privacy Assembly is that these, as far as I'm concerned, after doing a number of interviews uh, and events with uh, the people on the stage and, and uh, their colleagues across different jurisdictions is their heroes. They're doing a lot with not a lot, and they need as much support uh, as they can get. Um, and so there needs to be assistance at all stages. Um, and our project in particular is working with 
uh, organizations in places where the law hasn't been passed yet. So from drafting, um, those organizations need to hear from people who have passed and understand um, some of these enforcement challenges so that the legislation in, on their side can be um, improved. And then also any updates, setting up the DPAs, revising regulations, and then constant evaluation of what's working and what's not working. Um, again, something that was emphasized over and over again is advocating for independence from the start um, and really thinking through what local needs and capacities look like. Um, collaboration with civil society and other regulatory agencies, that's something that we're really trying to uh, build up, is to build up technical expertise amongst human rights organizations, but uh, we've seen uh, you know, privacy report cards that um, many organizations do, and it helps the regulator. Um, we've seen help with uh, court cases and enforcement, um, and so really thinking about bridges and ways to, to collaborate. Um, that relates to cultivating open dialogue and cultures of privacy. I'm so glad that you're able to talk to your neighbors in grocery stores about privacy complaints, but uh, really getting data subjects to understand what their rights are and to complain um, and to understand what they're owed and what data protection even means so it's not a bunch of de technocrats in a room um, uh, and involving the media. Uh, and then uh, over and over again, we heard there needs to be more funding for education programs, especially in computer science and law schools at universities. Um, and then what you're all here for, or at least some of you, uh, collaboration across regions. There's uh, a lot to be learned from each other. Uh, and there, you know, absent regional harmonization in regions, I think there's a lot to be shared. I know there's the Common Threads Network, um, but I think a lot can be done to support the really wonderful work that everyone on the stage is doing. And I put the link to our report uh, there, and um, I really hope you read it. I'm happy to pass it over to Bartlett. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And um, Bartlett, um, look forward to hearing your views about the, the region as a whole. Thank you. So, Hi, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for, for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to use the next uh, few minutes that you're setting my timer to not run over um, to sort of tell a story, really, about the Caribbean, generally. And the idea is to sort of like do a time lapse over the years to give you a sense of the path we've come along. And in doing so, uh, also sort of explain, you know, um, with reference to two specific jurisdictions who are fairly different on the face of it, um, why we are where we are and some of the factors that are impacting uh, the approach or approaches we've been taking to the passage of privacy laws and enforcement of privacy laws and so on. Um, and perhaps if you're listening in and you're not a regulator, you, you, may be, you may sort of perceive this as a short story on what that may mean for you uh, from a compliance perspective. Um, so let's see if I can figure this out. So big picture, on the face of it right now, if you do a check, um, and I should caveat what you're seeing right now by saying on the face of it, um, <laughs> Caribbean doesn't have a strict definition, and that has implications for how you do your numbers when you do an assessment of the Caribbean and uh, the status of the laws and the passage of laws and that kind of a thing. And so, for instance, um, depending on whose metric you're using, Bermuda, where we are right now, is in the Caribbean. Depending on other metrics, it is not. Um, if you were to jump all the way down to South America, there are countries that are in South America who, again, depend on the metric you're using and the base you're using, they're a part of the Caribbean. Others would say they're not. So like, for example, Guyana or Suriname. Same with Central America. Belize is considered as just any other Caribbean jurisdiction for most of us in the Caribbean. Uh, but many people go, but wait a minute, it's in Central America, what are you talking about? No. So using the broadest reasonable definition I could, uh, that's the basis for the figures you're seeing here now which does encompass all the countries that are within the Caribbean Sea or 
a bound or touching a bound the Caribbean Sea and have a strong political, historical, or cultural connection to the islands within the Caribbean Sea. And using that definition, um, we, we're saying now we're at a stage where there are 25 countries with privacy laws and eight without. Now, let's go back a bit. In the year 2000, there is not one country in the Caribbean, as I've defined it, with a privacy law on the books. Not one. Um, you fast forward about three years, and then two countries pop up with laws on the books. One, the Bahamas, and the other, St. Vincent. And it stays like this you know, for quite a bit of years. There's some conversations at the regional level about what privacy laws should look like. Um, there are some international agreements that make vague references to data protection, but then meaningfully, nothing sort of happens. And then we fast forward a few more years, and then all of a sudden, it's as if there's a watershed moment. And so by the time we got to 2019, just a few years ago, in the larger scheme of things, half of the countries suddenly had privacy laws in the books. And then you jump a bit again to where we are right now, where it's 25 out of 32 or they're about, and the definitions keep jumping. Even in doing this presentation, I kept going back and forth, which one should I use? Um, and so the numbers go up to as high as 34, depending on the one you use, and it can go as low as 28, it, it depends. And so the larger point is, there's clearly a, 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 a sort of strong wind that's in the sails of Caribbean jurisdictions. And, but what's interesting is, and we probably don't have the time to go into all of this is, what's behind all of it. And the motivations vary throughout the region. And so, for instance, um, so before we do that, let's just go through big picture, pretty much what I just mentioned, which is that there's no like common set of reasons for everybody. But we do see a bunch of things that tend to be the reasons that, that, that lead to the passage of privacy laws. Um, in, the, in the modern dispensation, we see quite a few jurisdictions where uh, there has been a subtle, soft kind of pressure from multilaterals, the lending agencies who say, yes, we'll give you the funds to do this amazing new digital transformation project you want to do, but, and then that's the entry point. We also see some countries entering into international agreements with a lot of other countries. And part and parcel of what is insisted on by some of these other countries, a good example is the, the EPA, uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement that was entered into between uh, the European Union and CARICOM plus the Dominican Republic, we call it CARIFORUM. And uh, the whole point, well, not the whole point, one of the things that were tucked away into the EPA was the requirement for all the member countries to have privacy laws on the books within a certain amount of years. And those tend to be some of the, the kind of like external pressure type reasons you see. But there are also sort of like domestic and um, uh, localized reasons around the, the, the passage of privacy laws as well. Um, and some that I would say are both international and local. So for example, there are a number of international business jurisdictions who, because locally you want to attract and continue to attract international business, and part and parcel of that is showing that you're a well-regulated, well-run jurisdiction, including things like doing things like passing privacy laws, which means that implicitly confidentiality is important to your jurisdiction, which tends to be important to the international business community sometimes, depending on the context. Which brings me uh, to the two countries I, I chose to use. I chose Cayman and Guyana. Largely because, well, I don't think anybody else would be speaking about them on this panel. And, oh, yeah, I have a minute left. And also because they're very different. So Cayman is more reflective of those jurisdictions that are part and parcel, that are, they have international business as a significant sector or contributor to their economies, right? And you're thinking of other jurisdictions like Bermuda or the BVI or Barbados, um, Turks and Caicos, you name it. Um, and so being in, in that grouping means that how you position yourself is important. And as I mentioned, being well run, being well regulated is part and parcel of the cell, if only implicitly sometimes. Excuse me, but I've got one more minute. Yes, that's what I'm, I'm closing on right now. 
And then there's a Ghana, which is more reflective of those economies that don't have an international business sector per se or a thriving one. And most of your, your work is focused in other areas. It's more domestically or regionally focused, your exports and that kind of a thing. Now, what are we seeing? We're seeing that, first of all, um, the, 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 the nature of the laws passed in these two different kinds of jurisdictions are different. And so, for example, what you find, and you've heard it sort of subtly suggested by the regulators um, who've spoken before, is that in the international business type communities um, or, or jurisdictions, uh, you tend to have a law that's passed that while it may reflect some of the, the more fundamental things that we've come to accept as being uh, normal or necessary uh, for a well-run privacy jurisdiction, they don't, however, go the further step of, of attempting to mirror, for example, the kind of thing that you'd see in the GDPR. So the fundamentals are all there, and in that sense, they're similar, but they're also different because they're, they're very uh, curated to the local circumstances to ensure that they balance the different milieu of rights properly based on what their local context quite a bit. Um, whereas in other jurisdictions, we tend to see something different, which is where the pressure is more towards uh, passing laws which are essentially a, a kind of rubber stamp because it's just about getting it done quickly to pass the muster with the multilaterals, that kind of a thing. Now, I'm going to end there in the q and I'm sure we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Bartlett. Yes, and, we, uh, we really regret cutting each speaker yes, short because indeed. each one could speak for <laughs> half an hour very easily and in a very interesting way. So we are rather apologetic to our speakers, trying to respect the time. Lastly, we have Patrick. Thank you for patiently waiting, and we're going to hear the DPO view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and good evening, everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting a data controller like ourselves. You've heard from the regulators, you've heard from the researcher, and you have heard a comparison between two countries which are at disparate ends of the spectrum, as it were in terms of what their economies look like. Well, the University of the West Indies is operating across the entire Caribbean. And we are in a very peculiar position because we have to operate in line with the regulations from all these countries. We operate across all the Caribbean. We have 50,000 students. We have five campuses. Four of these campuses are physical campuses, and one is a virtual campus, mostly. And in addition to that, if that wasn't complicated enough, we also have global centers which operate across the rest of the world from North America, including the US and Canada, as well as far south as Africa. So we have to look across the entire globe to ensure that we are in compliance. We are much like any large multinational company. But today, I'll be talking to you about the Jamaican Data Protection Act, because that one comes into effect, full effect, on December 1, in a few months' time. Now, as I said, we do operate across the other jurisdictions, which already have their acts in place. But the Jamaican Act, much like the other acts, what we have found, are based on some principles. And as you can see from the slide, these principles are eight principles. They're very, very similar, fair and lawful processing, obtained only for specified lawful purposes. The quality of the data must be ensured. It must be accurate and up-to-date. The retention must be limited, and so on. The biggest challenge for a university like ours is that of international transfers. Because, as Barlett would have said to you, not all jurisdictions in the Caribbean have data protection acts. So we have to be doing some very peculiar things, some very specific things, some very targeted things in the university to ensure that we do not breach this particular act, the Jamaican Act. But not only this one, but the one in Barbados, and also the one in the Bahamas and also the ones in all the other countries. It's a very difficult tightrope to walk on. What are some of the challenges that we've been finding? Well, the biggest one right now in the Jamaican space is the registration. Now, 
the registration must be done by December 1. And the large institution that we are, we had to do some very specific things. What we had to do, we had to break up our institution into four different work, six, sorry, different working groups. These working groups were responsible for ensuring compliance across the entire university. These range from things like records management, ICT, obviously, the legal bit, but we had to communicate this across the region to our various tentacles and our marketing and communication department was really critical in this. We had to look at our internal processes. The biggest thing with data protection that we have found is really business processes. These have to be properly dealt with, they have to be properly streamlined, and they have to be properly optimized, especially in the context where you only have three days to report a breach once you found it to the commissioner. That is a very critical bit that we had to be careful to pay attention to. And that is why we had to ensure that we built awareness. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had a debate with a professor. Well, I have had to be debating with a thousand professors. <laughs> it's very difficult. And they nitpick at everything, the definition of personal data, the definition of sensitive personal data. They don't agree with that clause. <laughs> Instead of focusing on compliance. These are some of the things that we focus on. We have a difficulty. The next challenge we have is that to do with the data protection impact assessment. Now, this is required. In the Barbadian context, it is a lot more restrictive. In the Jamaican context, it's a lot broader. It's very broad. In fact, it encompasses all functional areas. What we have done in the Jamaican context, we have not looked at all functional, functional areas, Commissioner. We've selected only three critical ones, finance, HR, and our alumni development sections. And then, that is our first phase. And then the next phases will include the other functional areas. Internally, we have to do the transfer impact assessments because remember we're transferring two departments in the same institution in another country, which then exposes the university to compliance related risks in that other country. So we've got some very good resources, especially from the ICO, and we've pulled on these resources to help us to get things done. Now, We've put in place some very specific measures to address risks. We've had to change our disciplinary code. We've recognized that persons are not taking this as seriously as they should. And therefore, because the institution is liable for, for these fines, we've had to change how we not only onboard persons, but how things are dealt with from a disciplinary perspective. The important bit for us as an institution is to ensure that we don't fall afoul of the regulators, but also to ensure that as an entity, our stakeholders, both internal and external stakeholders, are comfortable with what we're doing. We are a university. We're going to be sending persons out there. We're dealing with all sorts of data. But before you come to us, the confidence must be reposed. So we're not doing this because the regulators say so. But we're doing this because we are an accountable organization and we are responsible to ensure that we protect the personal information of all of our stakeholders. That's my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you to all presenters exercising extreme self-discipline. Uh, and it's unfortunate because there's so much more we could say or they could share with you. Now, we have a little time for questions, so uh, we have our own questions prepared, of course, but if someone in the audience has the questions or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Are there any show of hands? Any hands up? Do you have any? Yes. Well, someone in the front. Anyone else ready to ask? Well, we'll start with you. Could you give your name and organisation, please? So I'm Ben Rapp from Securis, but uh, we 
Excuse me, one minute, please. Sorry, yeah. coming. Great. Uh, ben Rapp from Securis. We act as DPO for Sajikor across the whole Caribbean. And uh, Dr. Anglin, I feel your pain. I really do. <laughs> Could you say what Sajikor is? Uh, Sajikor is an integrated financial services institution across the Caribbean right. offering pretty much every financial service you okay. could imagine, although not in every country. Um, we have a, just under 2 million data subjects across the Caribbean, so it's okay. a fairly large right. undertaking. Um, I'm very pleased to see Ms. Graves here in particular. We've spoken once or twice. Uh, <laughs> there are many, many questions I could ask, but I think, I think the one that, that probably plays best to this is what are our chances of getting harmonization across the Caribbean, particularly in terms of things like definitions of sensitive data, but also treatment of international transfers between Caribbean jurisdictions? Well, indeed, that's one of the purposes of this session, to see if we could find some common themes and common approaches. Would anyone like to volunteer to answer that for us? What are the chances of a common approach to definitions and international <clears throat> transfers? I'll this take a stab at it. Sure, okay. Okay. Um, I think we'll get there eventually, but to put it in a way I think everybody will understand, for a lot of us, that's a tomorrow problem because we have a today problem which is just trying to get the actual commission up and running. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it is, you're trying to get your house in order, and then we'll start to look at standardization across the region, and, our, and we'll, we'll come to our consensus as to how things will be done, and Marissa and I and Alex, everybody will be on the same page as you transfer from Bermuda to Barbados to Jamaica. But for a lot of us right now, that's a tomorrow problem. We still grappling with the today problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Getting to give a timeline, it's, it's difficult. So it's an aspiration mm -hmm. to have greater It's congruent. a goal. We see the goal, yeah. but we're here and the goal is there. <laughs> so are we talking about possibly five years ahead? Uh, you see. Ten years ahead. <laughs> Something like that. Oh. Well, yeah. I want to jump in from, Sorry, from a university perspective. Mm -hmm. I believe that that is where we have a lot to offer. One of the things that the university is already a CARICOM institution, and I'm not sure if you understand what CARICOM is. That's the CARICOM community. That is a group of countries which have come together, much like the EU, to do business. And what we have recognized is that we can lend quite a bit to this space. We recognize the disparities because we have to operate across all the countries. And we have offered to bring everybody together. But as Lisa said, they're all out in their own fires now. But in terms of an honest brokerage, we can offer that. And, but I don't believe it's going to happen now or even within the next year or two at least until after people comes into place. So, but I think in about three years' time, we can then have a serious discussion where we come to the table in a forum similar to this one and then say, okay, these are the disparities in the definitions. These are the gaps. Let's try to fix them. Yeah, so uh, the European, we must remember that the European, first of all, the European community and then the European Union took years to get the, first of all, the directive through and then the regulation. So this is a very big ambitious project. And indeed, you've mostly met here for the first time. So there's going to be a lot of work to be done to make these. I think we can agree it's a good objective, but it obviously can take time. Now, Michael Wright, were you going to say, add to yeah, a different just, point? I want to add to that. Um, we, we are currently in the Bahamas undergoing, like I indicated, a national digitization project. Within that project, we're also dealing with the interoperability of systems within the ministries and agencies. In order for us to realize success with that, we need to start from somewhere. We meet them where they are. The question is, meeting them where they are, does that create more of a harm and the vulnerabilities are exposed and slow down? So as, as much as across data flows across the Caribbean, may seem difficult. It's much more difficult probably in each respective island nation because the authorities, back to the data protection authorities, we're able to put standards in place in the form of regulations and we say this is law so you comply. 
this is how we're going to transfer data. This is what we look for. This is what we need you to do. And then we cooperate. I believe it's easier for us to achieve that than to achieve it within our own respective island nations. Yeah, so there's some... There is enough, there's a lot of work to be done just in the English-speaking yes. um, jurisdictions. And then, of course, there's the um, civil law jurisdictions as well and different languages. So it's difficult enough to work at harmonization just in the English-speaking jurisdictions. The, um, Partly, yes, please. So these questions have the right answer and then the truth. Um, you know, the right answer is idealistic. Yeah, we could see this happening in the three to five years. The truth is, it's not going to happen anything close to that for several <laughs> reasons. If I'm just being frank about it, a lot of them political, some have to do with like the, the disparity in just the economies that we're dealing with and their desire born out of that to want to integrate at all. Um, because truly, the questions of like interoperability and just like standardized approach across the regions have to do with an economic question of wanting to further integrate. Um, and we are in a, a very sort of like interesting space in the region right now, which is, I think, a potential opportunity if we were to see it in the right way. But, you know, it's also potentially uh, a break point in a sense that, um, so let me look at, let me, let me frame it this way. For something like a regional type framework, whatever form it's going to take to actually take flight, what are some of the fundamentals we have to have in place from a CARICOM perspective? I'm specifically speaking to CARICOM. I'm not necessarily considering jurisdictions outside of that because it makes this a more focused conversation for right now. We don't have a lot of time. First of all, the idea would need to be socialized at CARICOM level. There would then need to be some kind of formal adoption of a position. After that formal adoption, there's going to be a period of years in reality, if we're just using past experiences, um, for there to be a back and forth to arrive at some kind of like formal position. And then there's going to be a next period of years for trying to get that formal position on the road, whether it's a treaty-based arrangement or what have you. And so realistically, even if I'm being idealistic, the truth is we're looking at 10 years down the road for that kind of a thing. And so from the business community, the question is then, well, what do you do in the interim? Yep. That's a whole other conversation. Right. Yep. Okay. That's exactly the Thank conversation. You. I think yep. we've taken that as far as we can, that question. CARICOM, we should note up, Caribbean community does have an, an initiative in the area of cyber security. I think technical things are easy, easier than legal things. And there, uh, we could also mention that the Commonwealth Secretariat has prepared model privacy law um, with various options, and that's sort of in the background, but it's there as a, an influencer. Potentially. In addition to the Commonwealth Secretariat, there is HIPCAR, which is a project to harmonize IT policies across the Caribbean, and it does have its own set of templates in terms of data protection and privacy laws. But I think your question was really a basic question. What are we talking about? And operationally, I, I believe what Bartos is saying, and I agree. But from the fundamental perspectives of just def definition, what is privacy? And I know it's a, it's a worldwide problem, but for our region, what are we talking about when we say personal data? So for example, in Jamaica, the definition of personal data includes somebody, somebody who has died less than 30 years ago. It doesn't happen in other countries. We need to standardize those things, and I don't think it's going to take 10 years for that. I don't. Um, and I probably am idealistic. But we need to just pull it together. Um, and four like these can actually help us by showing us the value, both economically and otherwise, of doing it. Companies like yours, like Sajikura, can pressure the government, should pressure the governments. Okay. Organizations <laughs> like mine should do the same. Okay. Well, there's goodwill in terms of achieving harmony, but it's been a long time because the Lisa Group says must focus on today's issues. Right. Any other <laughs> questions or comments? Sorry. Okay, can we have a microphone over there, please? Give your name and organization. Hi, um, I'm Andre Palmer, uh, representing a company called Simtai Consulting based in Jamaica. We help organizations to implement uh, a data protection framework, essentially. Uh, question for, for Lisa. You mentioned the risk-based approach that is a fundamental philosophy of your Data Protection Act. Yep. So there are lots of different ways to do a, a, a risk a uh, risk assessment, right? And I can either implement or use uh, an approach that suits a particular end that I want to get to. So for the accompanying regulations for the um, Barbados Data Protection Act, is there any guideline around how to conduct uh, a, a risk assessment 
so that there is at least some standardization of the outcome? And if the answer is yes, can you share maybe what the, the highlights are? Okay. Um, I don't necessarily agree. <laughs> I do agree there's more than one way to conduct a risk assessment, but I don't, I think the basis, the genesis of a risk assessment is assessing vulnerabilities and assessing threats, right? Because vulnerabilities and threats is what defines risk. So as it relates to the guidance, there will be a guidance, especially as it relates to the data protection impact assessments, which is the use of new technologies. But it will be a guidance because you, your question is an example of how people want you to prescribe to them what to do. A risk-based approach says you determine the risk. Do you see what I mean? You identify, you assess, you mitigate. And then, so that, so it will be a guidance as opposed to a how-to. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. You've also, also <laughs> several of our speakers in our planning meetings have said you look at what the ICO is doing in the UK. <clears throat> Well, the ICO in the UK is very well resourced these days and they produce a lot of guidance, which has been quite helpful, I understand, yeah. here in, in this region as well. So it'll be a guidance, a yeah. guidance surrounding it. But ultimately, it will be up to the entity to determine how they're going to conduct the risk assessment. And then in certain areas under the Barbados Act, the risk assessment will have to be submitted to the commission for the commission to determine if the risk assessment was extensive enough and if it did what it was supposed to do. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Please just go to the microphones. Whilst you're thinking about it, uh, can I ask Laura something about your research, just about DPA independence? Obviously, we've been talking about how to set up office and based on your research, what you found out in Latin America and Africa, what would you say are the kind of cornerstones for DPA independence and how can they at the same time have the sort of financial resources well secured? Yeah, uh, I mean, the people that we interviewed, the regulators that we interviewed came from a lot of different perspectives and um, experiences and some of them uh, experienced many levels of uh, failure uh, to establish independence. Um, so many of them were situated in uh, ministries and um, they didn't have budgetary independence, um, so fighting for resources amongst a lot of different uh, diverse uh, needs, especially um, around COVID, and also um, fighting to be able to um, enforce their laws, uh, with, especially with public entities. Um, in a lot of the places that we were doing interviews, um, most of, many of the data breaches are government entities and also the uh, lowest level of compliance are with public entities as well. And so the uphill battle for those regulators were to uh, make sure that those entities are um, abiding by the law and trying to comply with the law and um, doing that in a place where they have very little power to do so. Um, political parties are also uh, pretty terrible uh, uh, compliers, and um, depending on who is in power and the executive, uh, being able to enforce um, thing, uh, really important, um, their mandate around elections has is also been quite a challenge. Um, I would recommend reading the foreword to our report by Eduardo Bertoni, who talks about the history of the Argentinian data protection law and then the updates to that, which corrected some of the failures that they had, but essentially um, what happens in a couple of places, happened in a couple of places um, with regulators we interviewed where the law gets passed um, and then the uh, parts of the law that create the DPA and make it independent and make it funded get vetoed. Uh, so you have a law that's passed and then you don't have any guidance on um, what the DPA is supposed to look like, its structure, uh, and that all comes in, in in the later parts and it's messy and um, <clears throat> the people and person who are responsible for uh, making sure that law is enforced and implemented are left with, with a bit of a mess. And a follow-up question to Bartlett, really. How do you see enforcement developing in the region now? Because I noticed this, at least in the Cayman Islands law, there's some really quite strict um, 
powers to the yep. commissioner could stop processing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you see that actually happening? So I think there are a couple of things that are going to be impacting um, enforcement. Um, I don't want to focus on two of those. One, the nature of the jurisdiction where we're talking about enforcement, and two, the question of resources. Um, so, for example, you mentioned Cayman. In the Cayman context, if you're to pay attention to the enforcement activity over the past few years, you'll realize something. And it's that it's nothing like what you're used to seeing, for example, in the European Union. Um, there are no out-of-this-world type fines or anything of the sort. Most of the effort around enforcement is focused primarily on getting people to realize you've done something wrong and then voluntarily taking, or not voluntarily, but taking corrective steps without there being necessarily a huge uh, fine on the back end or anything of the sort. Um, you know, people might be reprimanded, that kind of a thing. But generally, the, the regulator has not taken a sort of aggressive approach to enforcement. And if I think this is deliberate, I don't speak on behalf of anyone, but I think it's deliberate, and it's because of the nature of the jurisdiction. You're in the international business space. You're not trying to scare businesses away. So why would you be aggressively hitting everyone with big fines left, right, and center? Who wants to set up shop in your jurisdiction if that's how you approach things? Um, the other aspect to this is the whole question of resourcing. Now, I mean, we all know that every now and again, um, if you appropriately enforce, it can send the appropriate signals, and then it has the appropriate spill-on effect where you don't need to enforce against everybody who's possibly done something uh, bad or could have done something that's a fault of the laws. But if you choose the right person or entity to enforce against, then it'll have that sort of effect ideally, right? Um, but if you have no resources, how do you even get to even start the enforcement process, right? I mean, the reality that we see across the region in some jurisdictions is on paper there's a regulator, but in reality you pick up the phone, there's nobody to call. There's no office set up. There's none of that stuff. And so if you can't get the foundational startup pieces off the ground, then enforcement is really just a theoretical conversation and not a realistic one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? We can say that the regional cooperation at the moment is very much language-based. One of our speakers, I think, you referred to the British and Islands Group, which is um, UK and Ireland, Gibraltar, Malta, and Bermuda, right? And so that group is already there. And there's another group, the Latin American Group, which is obviously based in Spanish and Portuguese-speaking languages, which includes not only Latin American countries, but also Spain and Portugal, and also Cuba. So Cuba is being drawn in, although we're coming from a different political background, it's being drawn into the sort of the mainstream of data protection law through these language groups. Uh, and the French-speaking group, of course, would then they would be including uh, Quebec or France, obviously Belgium, Switzerland, but also Canada and Martinique, you know, one of the French-speaking jurisdictions here. Yeah. I'm not sure the Dutch-speaking groups are so strong, but the other ones that I mentioned certainly are or, or their forces for cooperation. So I think the, it's a question of whether the governments are in the region here think there are, can see the benefits of getting together the group. After all, geographically, you're much nearer than <laughs> grouping with those far away in Latin America or Europe. So it's a challenge, I suppose, when the governments see uh, there's an economic benefit or they can see the advantage of companies working smoothly across the region in, uh, in co incorporating common definitions and international transfer norms, then that will make it work. Okay. Any last-minute comments from our panel? Because we're close to our finishing time, which we realise is somewhat after the original finishing time. Does anyone, any of our speakers, <coughs> like to make any final comments on how they see the future developing? Uh, so, so let me let me start. Uh, so we've started the initiatives across the Caribbean. What we really need now is a paradigm shift, a cultural shift, from how we used to operate to one where privacy, however defined, is at the forefront of how we do business, of how we operate, and that is going to be very difficult. But organisations like mine must start by speaking to their stakeholders about what they are doing to change their culture. And then, and only then, I believe, the other organizations or the other stakeholders will follow suit. It must start with a cultural change, how we 
operate, how we do business, even how we answer the telephones. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I think we probably need to finish now, unless any of our members... No, okay. But you, I think you are all here tonight and all here in the next few days. So uh, there's an opportunity for anyone in the audience to speak to our panel individually and get to know each other. And um, that's a good purpose that we've fulfilled. So I'd like to thank my fellow moderator, Laura, of course, and all our speakers. It's been very difficult to get everyone in time, but you have. So thank you. And I hand back, I hand back the floor to our host. You've got to tell us where to go next. Right, a decision is here. We've got to hand the floor back to Alex White. Right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and so we're very grateful for all of our colleagues uh, today. And our, our next item on the agenda is the reception. And I'm sorry, the reception will not be live streamed. 